Good day, everybody. No, it's not morning. It's 12.30. It's afternoon. Good day, everyone. I have, a, I have a trivia question for you. What happens on April 8, 2024? Eclipse, yes. The total eclipse. How many people saw the one in, in 2017? Oh, that's weak. Wow. Okay, so save the date, right? April 8th, 2024. We're going to be in Texas, aren't we? Because that's the closest place to see it. Probably the best weather to see it. But if you've never seen a total eclipse, you got to see it. It's completely different than any other natural phenomenon, like it's in its own category. When you see it, you say, oh, now I understand why I traveled three days to come and see this. So Hugh may say something about it when he comes up here. But April 8th, 2024, I'm going to keep mentioning it, mentioning it because all you people who think it's no big deal, it's a really big deal. Thank you to all the people that brought treats back there. Thank you to Norm and Marie Ann. And thank you to Mark and Val and anybody else that I don't know about. Next week, Mark Clark is going to be back. He was here a few weeks ago, and he's going to finish his two-part series. And then th two weeks after, from today, um, Robert Cavolo is going to be back for three weeks finishing his series on Abraham Kuyper, which he can take. Robert's such a good teacher that he can take this guy that almost none of us have ever heard of after one week, and we're saying, yeah, I really want to finish because he's really interesting, really interesting. So Hugh's going to be in Washington, D.C. next week, and he's going to tell us all about it and then where he's going to be after that. And it's a really good idea to actually listen when he tells us this so we know where he is and how to pray, and we need to support him. We're trying to get the class back up to what it was before, so one of the things that I would like to do again is have a book table. We used to have a book table. So if any of you feel like that's something you might want to take on, um, it would mean getting the books from RTB and setting them up every week and taking the money and going to Vegas. No, I mean <laughs> turning it back into RTB and getting more books. If that's something you feel like you could do to help support the class and promote RTB, um, let me know. It would be really terrific. So my joke this morning is also a linguistics lesson, okay? This is really important, so listen. A linguistics professor says during a lecture that in English, a double negative forms a positive. But in some languages, a double negative is still a negative. But, it, but he said, in no language in the world, can a double positive form a negative? And some guy in the back says, yeah, right. <laughs> Let's say a prayer. Lord God, thank you for jokes. Thank you that we can laugh. It's a world right now that it's hard to laugh in. Lord, we thank you for Dr. Hugh Ross. We thank you for this class. We thank you for just normalcy. Lord, ask your blessing on Hugh as he teaches us this morning and on each one of us as we go our way this afternoon. And Lord, bless Hugh for the next four weeks when he's going to be gone. Give him strength and focus and energy and joy in teaching where he's going to teach, Lord. Help us all to pray for him and support him. We just thank you again for Paradox Class. What a blessing it is to be here year after year. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Please welcome Dr. Hugh Ross.
Yeah, next Sunday I'll be in Washington, D.C. We're doing several events there, which you can see on the reasons.org uh, events page. And uh, next week, uh, Dr. Mark Clark will be teaching. It'll be a, a part two of a series on how to uh, be a Christian in a politically uh, charged uh, world. And uh, it's going to be taking a lot of lessons from Scripture because a lot of people who are heroes in Scripture, including Jesus, uh, were faced uh, with that challenge. And then Robert Covolo is going to follow, and uh, he's a, a theologian and a historian. He's going to talk to you about Abraham Kuyper, uh, probably the best example of an overachiever you could ever think of. Uh, he was the prime minister of the Netherlands. Uh, he was a theologian. He launched a university. He launched a newspaper. Uh, and he did scientific research as well, uh, physics research. Uh, an incredible individual and a really uh, strong follower of Jesus Christ. He basically jumped into theology because he was disturbed by the liberalism that was beginning to happen sweeping out uh, through Europe. So that's what's going to be happening in the next four weeks here in the Paradoxes class. And, uh, you know, the solar eclipse, yes, April 8th of next year. And uh, we reserved a location in Texas. Uh, it's going to sweep across the United States, but your best opportunity to see it uh, will be in Texas because they have the best weather. And we also picked a location where you get the longest uh, totality. It'll be a little more than four and a half minutes, long enough that it will get dark enough that you can see stars. I mean, the solar eclipse that we saw in... Uh, 2017. It was only two minutes long. And the nice thing about short solar eclipses, you get to see the full extent of the corona. I remember being there in the desert of Arizona, or not Arizona, uh, Oregon, looking up at it, and I could see the corona go out 10 degrees away from the moon. Now, with a long solar eclipse, you really don't get to see much of the corona, uh, but you do get to see uh, the sky uh, go dark, and you get to see stars that are close to the sun, and uh, it will get cooler. I mean, even with that two-minute eclipse, it got 20 degrees cooler uh, during totality, and so you have the temperature drop, and it goes back up again. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, listening to one of our Reasons to Believe volunteers. Uh, we gave them a, a speaking slot, because the one we're going to be doing in Texas, it's going to be a conference uh, on uh, solar physics and uh, apologetics and uh, how we can use that uh, to share the Christian faith. So we're going to have a conference there, several lectures. We're going to be doing evening uh, events where we don't just look at the sun, we look at galaxies and the stars. I'm really hoping that the president of our Spokane chapter will bring his telescope to the event. Uh, he's got a special truck for it. It actually ranks as the world's largest portable amateur telescope, 41 and a half inches. You have to climb up on a huge step ladder to look through the eyepiece. And uh, yeah, he was showing us galaxies where you could see all the spiral arms. Really, if you've never looked through a really large telescope, this would be an opportunity for that to happen. We'll have several telescopes there uh, because we are going to be in a really dark sky uh, place. And uh, so Reasons to Believe was able to reserve 250 slots. That's because we made the reservation two years ago. And one thing we discovered when we were doing things in 2017 is that when you get up to the time of the eclipse, people on the eclipse path realize just what a wonderful opportunity this is. And so they were charging $6,000 a night to stay at a two-star motel. Uh, on close to the eclipse path, and uh, even parking your car is a challenge. And so they were charging three and four hundred dollars just to have a place to park your car so that you could walk into the total eclipse path. So uh, what happened in 2017 is we rented a Christian camp, and it was long before they knew what, that the solar eclipse was going to be there. We didn't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> and so they gave us the normal deal. Uh, and we managed to find a Christian camp in Texas that likewise didn't realize they're on the total eclipse path. And so, uh, but uh, they basically told us 
that we couldn't really uh, promote it until the end of this month. But you can save the date. Uh, we, I think we've got three days reserved around that time. And yeah, it's going to be a bargain. Uh, they're charging $100 a night. That includes room and all your food and access to all the recreation facilities. So you don't have to spend $6,000 a night, just 100 and the food gets thrown in. What a deal. And uh, Well, uh, we've got the reservations, but they're going to be allowing people to reserve and officially get a spot. By the way, you've got your choice. Uh, you can have, you know, uh, there's a range of accommodations. I know it starts at 100 and goes up to about 150. So if you want really nice four-star type motel rooms, you can get that. Or if you're willing to bunk with a friend, uh, you can get a cheaper rate. And so that'll all be made available starting the end of this month at Reasons to Believe. So, but people have already been reserving spots. So if you call, you might be able to talk them into it and see what happens. Uh, I haven't got my spot reserved yet, but I understand uh, I'm going to have to go and bring my telescope and speak as well. So we're launching a new series today. And uh, it's a series that several of you have requested, and also a lot of people who participate with us virtually have requested. It's probably a topic I'm best known for publicly, and it's a design argument for the existence of God. Uh, but I've titled it, Design for Redemption. And I kind of went through the collection of books that I've written. Uh, there's now 22 books that I've written uh, for reasons to believe. I'm working on number 23. Uh, but six of those books are on the design argument for the existence of God. And what I'm going to be talking about today is that this argument is acknowledged for the last 2,000 years as being the most powerful, the most significant scientific argument for the God of the Bible. And atheists have also recognized that this is the keystone argument for the God of the Bible, and therefore they've been busy trying to draw up responses and rebuttals. And I'll be covering some of those today. But I'm going to begin with a story. But I think I told part of the story either last week or two weeks ago and this is very early in the Reasons to Believe Ministries, in fact, the very first year. And I gave a, a, little, a lecture at one of the local universities here, uh, and I was talking about uh, science and Genesis and how they're compatible, basically how the, the book of nature and the book of scripture work together. But then this gentleman came up to me afterwards and said, I'm a philosophy professor at this university. I want to challenge you to a debate. I said, okay, what, what do you want to talk about? Does God exist? And so uh, he said, you know, would you agree that the design argument for God is the most oftenly presented argument? I said, yeah, I think you're right. And uh, so he says, well, let's see if we can set up this debate. Well, I later found out that he was a professor on that campus and taught a course on why God does not exist and why the design argument is a failed argument. And so a lot of my friends were saying, Hugh, this guy's got a whole course prepared on this. Do not use a design argument in your debate. You know, there's all kinds of other evidences. But it was that very week I was reading a history book on World War II and the turning point of World War II which was the Battle of El Alamein. It was the first defeat of the Nazis in World War II. And uh, if you're not familiar with El Alamein, uh, you had Rommel and his uh, desert uh, army marching across Libya into Egypt, and uh, he got to within 60 miles of Cairo. And he stopped because he didn't have the equipment and the ammunition to go further, so he stopped and waited for a resupply. So he was building up all of his supplies uh, with the objective of pushing into Cairo and going into the Middle East and capturing all the oil resources of uh, Iraq and Iran. That was the plan. And uh, meanwhile, he was being opposed uh, by uh, General Montgomery, Bernard Montgomery of the British Army. And he realized what Rommel was doing, building up all of his 
uh, resources for a final push through Egypt and into the Middle East. Uh, but uh, this was a time uh, when America had just entered the war, and so uh, the British government basically talked uh, the Americans, okay, uh, we don't have the resources to land in France, but maybe we can do something in Africa. And so they encouraged the Americans to think about trying to set up some kind of invasion into the western part of Africa, but could you please equip uh, General Montgomery so that he could stop uh, this advance of Rommel. But Montgomery had a different plan. He says, I'm going to hit him head on. He says, he thinks he's going on the offensive, I'm going to go on the offensive. And everybody was saying, well, there's a swampy area depression uh, and maybe you can get around him. Why don't we do a flanking maneuver? As Rommel had said, I think we got the greatest chance of success if we strike Rommel at his strongest point, not his weakest point. And everybody was saying to Bernard uh, Montgomery, bad idea, it's not going to work. But the history books prove otherwise. He hit him hard at his strongest point, broke through, and managed to sweep, uh, you know, Mon or, uh, uh, Rommel all the way back into Tunisia. In fact, the retreat of the uh, German uh, desert army never stopped. Montgomery just kept pushing him day after day after day, thousands of miles right up into Tunisia and finally uh, into uh, Sicily. So I was reading that and I said, I think I'm going to use the same strategy. This professor is best known for destroying the design argument hey, Christians for 2,000 years have been using the design argument. Why don't I push with that? Uh, so I did. And, uh, you know, the debate took place on the university campus. And uh, it was one of our volunteers that came up to me after the debate was over. In fact, there was, we had four people at the book table, came up afterwards and said, I overheard a conversation between this professor and his 13-year-old son. And before the debate, the professor was bragging to his son, just watch, I'm going to destroy this Christian. Uh, and then the son came up afterwards and said, Dad, I think you already did a masterful job destroying that Christian. Look at all the people mobbing our book table. And there was nobody at the atheist book table. They were all at the Reasons to Believe <laughs> book table. <laughs> so the son was being sarcastic. So... <laughs> Any of you have ever had a 13-year-old son? You know that they're very gifted at sarcasm. I've had two sons, and yes, when they were 13 years of age, they had a way of saying things uh, to our, myself and to uh, my wife. Uh, and now that they're in their 30s, they still have a remarkable gift for sarcasm. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, let me jump into this. And I'm going to say to the end the argument that this philosophy professor used as his strategy for destroying the design argument. Uh, but of the five arguments I'm going to kind of review for you here, I think the one that he presented is actually the weakest of the five. But keep in mind, this debate happened, gee, 37 years ago. So uh, uh, the, you know, the stage has changed. Philosophers and scientists have developed uh, newer arguments. So, these are the five. The puddle analogy, the multiverse, you know, life as we don't know it, uh, the sample size is only one, and bad designs. And uh, this philosophy professor, that was mainly his assault on the design argument, is he led with the bad designs. In fact, I can share this with you. He had his talk all prepared. I spoke first. He spoke second, uh, but in his particular talk, what he had prepared was, you look at planet Earth and it's filled with bad designs. We have earthquakes, we have hurricanes, we have wildfires, we have you know, these viruses, etc. Well, in a couple of minutes in my presentation, I was explaining why uh, we have just the right level of hurricanes, just the right level of earthquakes, just the right level of wildfires, why we need to be thanking God for viruses and bacteria, disease, etc. I didn't realize that, but I took the heart right out of his message. And it was only done in a couple of minutes. 
and then kind of laid out uh, the reason why I thought the design argument not only was strong, but getting exponentially stronger every month. That was really the heart of my talk. Just uh, two minutes I was dealing uh, with the uh, bad design issue. Okay, the puddle analogy. The puddle analogy is this. Imagine that you're water and you're in this little uh, puddle. And the puddle says this. This is an interesting hole that I find myself in. This hole must have been perfectly, especially designed for me. And so atheists are basically saying the design argument is the same way. Uh, you know, we, we think the universe has been designed for us, uh, but the truth is uh, it's just like the puddle. The puddle uh, would notice this. Uh, but here's the question. Is a puddle a good analogy for life? Is water a good analogy for life? The thing about water in a puddle, uh, whatever hole it finds itself in, the water is going to fill it up. We've all always noticed this in the rainstorms we've been having these past few months. You go into your backyard or your front yard, there's these little holes there, and when it rains, they fill up. And so the water in the hole says, hey, uh, this hole is perfectly fit for me. The truth is, any hole will work for liquid water. But is it true that any universe will work for life? And so that's kind of the fundamental fallacy in the puddle analogy. What has amazed me is that this rebuttal of the design argument has found its way into the scientific literature. So you can go to the NASA archive website of scientific research papers in the physical sciences. You can put in the search engine, puddle analogy, and several papers will pop up most of them written by atheists trying to defend the puddle analogy as an argument against design uh, pointing to a supernatural creator. But you'll also find a number of articles written by Christian physicists basically using a lot of equations uh, to describe why uh, the puddle analogy does not work. Uh, and so life cannot fit into any universe. Uh, but then the atheists come back and say, well, life can adapt to any environment it finds itself in. Is that really true? I mean, if we were to change the environment of the universe, say, make the different constants of physics different, what would that do? Well, a number of books have been written. I've got over two dozen of them in my office that reasons to believe, written by physicists who are not believers at all, but nevertheless make the point. Change the values of any of the fundamental forces of physics, the constants that govern the forces of physics, or the velocity of light, or any of the fundamental constants of physics, by the tiniest degree, it eliminates the possibility of physical life, not just here on Earth, but anywhere in the universe. So change the fine structure constant, uh, change the velocity of light, uh, change the constant that governs the force of gravity, or electromagnetism, the other thing we discover is that ratios have to be just right. So for example, if you look at the constant that governs the force of electromagnetism and compare it with the force that governs the force of gravity, uh, the ratio between those two, change it by as little as one part in 10 to the 40th, there's no possibility of life anywhere, anytime in the universe. And so it's not true. Uh, that any environment that life finds itself in, it can adapt to it. Now, it is true uh, that the life we see here on planet Earth has been designed with the capability of adapting to changes in the environment. That's important because Earth provides us with a change in environment. For example, the weather tomorrow will not be the same as the weather today. Uh, but fortunately, we human beings are designed that we can tolerate uh, different changes in weather. By the way, for what it's worth, we humans are probably the most poorly designed for changes in the environment. However, most of us human beings have a closet. And uh, you, know, you look at the weather report, you go into your closet, and you put on clothing that's appropriate to the changed environment that you'll find outside. Now, your dog doesn't need that. Uh, your dog is designed in such a way that it doesn't have to put on clothes for the changing environment it finds in the outside. Uh, although I notice a lot of people who have pet dogs, they insist on dressing up their dogs anyway. Uh, but the dog doesn't really need it, but we humans uh, need it. 
So it's not true that life can adapt to any environment. It finds itself in the more advanced the life form, the less adaptable it is. Microbes, viruses, bacteria, uh, they're very much uh, capable. And Rudy, the puddle analogy, I think goes back to the Jurassic Park series. How many of you actually remember the first Jurassic Park movie that ever came out? And you probably remember the most famous line in that Jurassic Park uh, movie. You know, one of the scientists there makes the comment, life always finds a way. So that's the Jurassic Park uh, doctrine. And that's the doctrine that's really behind the puddle analogy. Life will always find a way. Well, is that Jurassic Park doctrine really true? I mean, change the environment of planet Earth, the sun, uh, our galaxy, change the environment, for, exa for example, make even the tiniest change in the planet Mars or the planet Venus. What does that do to life here on planet Earth? So that's kind of what we're going to be exploring in this series on fine-tuned designs, is that the evidence pointing to the God of the Bible is pervasive. Basically, I'm going to be sharing with you, hey, pick whatever feature in nature you want, whether it be biological, astrophysical, chemical, uh, it doesn't matter. You can focus on it because we see that the evidence for design is ubiquitously revealed throughout the record of nature, that the Bible actually promotes that point of view, uh, that we're all without excuse because of how clearly and abundantly God has revealed himself uh, throughout uh, the record of nature. Well, suffice to say, if you go into the scientific literature and look up all these papers written on the puddle analogy, the non-theists have basically conceded, yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, we thought it worked, but then these nasty, or, uh, you know, I wouldn't say nasty, but uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word I'm trying to find here. These pesky, these pesky Christian physicists had the audacity to publish rebuttals uh, to our papers and uh, they are so effective that we've got to stop using that argument. Okay, that's the puddle analogy. What about the multiverse? Well, I've shared with you a couple of times in our last series that one of the problems of the multiverse is that it explains too much. But another problem is it explains too little. So I'm going to kind of give you how you can use the two edges of the sword here. The multiverse is a bad argument against the God of the Bible, first because it explains uh, too much, and number two, it explains too little. You can go both ways. And I think by going both ways, you get the most effective uh, response to the multiverse. Uh, but a number of atheist theoretical physicists have basically been publishing articles making the point we atheists have got to stop using the multiverse. It explains everything. In other words, it explains too much. And it was Leonard Susskind, the American theoretical physicist, who said, any argument that explains everything explains nothing. And what I've shared with you in the past several weeks is an analogy to make Leonard Susskind's point. And basically what Leonard Susskind is saying, by the way, I remember saying this, it was back in the early 1980s when I first began to, in fact, I'm trying to remember, the first time I spoke on the design argument for God was at Caltech in the mid-1970s, just to my Caltech peers there. Uh, so I've been speaking on this for a long time. Uh, but I remember back in the 1980s speaking to church and university audiences and making a prediction. A time will come when the design argument for God, the fine-tune argument for God, will become so pervasive and so overwhelming that atheists will have nowhere else to go but to hypothesize that there's an infinite number of universes where they're all different from one another. And all these design features, that's just a lucky chance. We happen to be in the one lucky universe out of the infinite number of universes uh, where everything is just right. It's not God. It's just a pure stroke of luck because there's an infinite number of universes. Well, is there really an infinite number of universes? It was Albert Einstein who made the point when he launched his theory of general relativity uh, that in the equations of general relativity, 
it implies that once there is observers in a universe, those observers will never be able to observe anything outside their universe. And of course, we recognize that's the case. Our observations are limited to the universe in which we live. We can't observe the heavenly realm. Uh, we're only limited to what we can see in this universe of matter, energy, space, and time. So if God made 10,000 universes, we would never know. We can only make observations in our universe. And a number of German uh, philosophers uh, laid that point home, not just scientifically, but philosophically, in the incompleteness theorems. that we indeed are limited in what we can observe and detect and measure. So it's just that one uh, universe. But these atheists were saying, there's the possibility that there's more than one universe. Maybe there's an infinite number. But I remember back in the 1980s telling audiences, whenever an atheist appeals to infinity, they've got nothing. Because the thing about infinity is, infinity plus infinity still equals infinity. Infinity times infinity equals infinity. Infinity to the infinity power equals infinity. Infinity to the infinity power to the infinity power still equals infinity. So you can basically make anything happen if you appeal to infinity, and therefore anyone appealing to infinity really is conceding that they've got nothing, because infinity can explain uh, everything. And that's kind of Leonard Susskind's point. If it explains everything, it really explains nothing. But what I've done in the Creator and the Cosmos fourth edition I think it's also in this uh, book, Design to the Core, I just finished, is to give you an analogy. If you're going to appeal to an infinite number of universes, where you've got an infinity times infinity times infinity, infinity to the infinity power, that means you could actually have, by pure chance, an infinite number of planets identical to our planet Earth. And those infinite number of planet Earths, you can have an infinite variety of species. In fact, you can have an infinite variety of birch tree species. And I grew up in Canada. Birch trees are everywhere. They like a cold climate. But they have the property that they peel thin white pieces of bark. And uh, so if you've got an infinite variety of birch tree species, you'll have an infinite variety of these thin white pieces of bark that are being peeled. And with an infinite number of universes, there'll be one planet where you've got a birch tree species that peels thin white pieces of birch bark that are perfectly rectangular that measure eight and a half by 11 inches. And these pieces of thin white birch bark will randomly fall on soils and an infinite number of universes. You're gonna have an infinite variety of different particles and chemicals in that soil that are gonna imprint on all those little pieces of rectangular white uh, birch bark. All the uh, uh, sentences, paragraphs, diagrams, photographs, equations, uh, citations that are in every scientific research paper that's ever been published, which means those tens of millions of scientific research papers, they did not come from the minds of scientists. The multiverse did it. And so you're basically exposing the fallacy in any appeal to a multiverse to avoid concluding that there is a supernatural mind behind the universe that designed the universe so that we can live and thrive in it. If you're gonna to appeal to the multiverse to bypass the mind of the God of the Bible, you're simultaneously bypassing the minds of every human being who ever lived. And therefore you're exposing the contradiction or the fallacy or the flaw in the multiverse argument. But I found with audiences it's best if you combine uh, the negative argument that, hey, it doesn't work because it explains everything with the, another way of making a more positive case from a Christian perspective is that the multiverse explains too little. Now, again, I've been arguing for the existence of God based on the fine-tuned designs of the universe and all of its subcomponents in life ever since the mid-1970s. What I've noticed since the mid-1970s is that the evidence has been getting progressively stronger and stronger and more and more pervasive and more and more overwhelming. In fact, I remember reading back in 1988 uh, a book 
published uh, by the agnostic astrophysicist Paul Davies. And by the way, I've debated him publicly three times. It's always been a, a very friendly debate. And uh, in fact, I'm praying for Paul because I remember the last time uh, we had a public debate, he said afterwards, you know, next time I'm in the Los Angeles area, could I come by your office? I'd like to meet all your people. So he seems quite intrigued. In fact, I remember one debate I did with him uh, on the uh, British program, uh, unbelievable. He was basically saying, if you had reasons to believe, have a testable, falsifiable, predictive creation model, you deserve a place at the scientific table. This is what science should be all about. So he seemed very open to actually engaging on this. But I remember in 1988, he wrote this book, The Cosmic Blueprint. And it was like 240 pages. But at the end of the book, he basically said, look, I'm an agnostic, but as I look at the universe, the evidence that has been designed to make us possibly existing in the universe is overwhelming. Uh, so I put that quote in a couple of my books. But I remember uh, back in the 1980s just saying, it is getting not just overwhelming, but progressively more overwhelming. And what I'm gonna be doing in this series is basically giving you uh, some demonstration for that. And what I'll be doing is saying, hey, if we not only look at the design of the universe, but look at the design of our galaxy cluster, our galaxy, our star, our planetary system, our planet, what we can observe as we survey the scientific literature is that the evidence gets stronger and stronger with every week that goes by. In fact, what you'll see in the crater in the cosmos is I document that over a 40-year period, the evidence uh, for the design of the universe uh, from the hand of God is getting a minimum of a thousand times stronger with every passing month, which was great when I would speak on university campuses because I'd always end my talk by saying to the audience, look, if you're not a believer, if you're a skeptic, I would encourage you, wait one month. If the evidence for which you've heard me speak today gets at least a thousand times stronger, then you need to seriously consider what the Bible's got to say, and what's God got to say about how you should live your life. A thousand times stronger. One reason why I like the design argument, where else can you go in Christian apologetics and get a thousand times stronger case for your position in just a single month? And as you're gonna see in this series, that factor of a thousand is conservative. It's actually even more dramatic than that. But that's one way you can kind of respond to the multiverse argument. If the multiverse is really true, that there's this huge array of universes, and we just by pure chance are living in the one lucky one where everything is just right, there really is no God, then as we learn more and more about the universe and our galaxy, our planetary system, our star, our planet, and the life that's on this planet, we should see that the evidence that has been designed for the specific purpose and benefit of us, human, of us human beings, that evidence should begin to begin to decline and plateau and then begin to drop. On the other hand, if there really is the God of the Bible behind this, a God who's got a purpose for humanity, who holds humanity in very high value, then as we study the record of nature, we should see that the evidence for fine-tuned design will continue to rise. It will not begin to bend over, it will not plateau, it will not drop, it will continue to rise. And so this is how we can test the atheist version explanation for the fine tuning versus the Christian version of the fine tuning. Is the scientific evidence getting progressively stronger for the God of the Bible being the answer for the fine tuning uh, or is the declining evidence for design basically showing us that, hey, it's the multiverse that explains it. And so again, I found with audiences that if we kind of go both ways with this, uh, show that it explains too much and that it also explains uh, too little, that this can work as well. Okay. Life as we don't know it. And I see that I've actually gone uh, my 30 minutes. 
So uh, I'm going to kind of give you a quick review here, and we'll pick this up in four weeks' time when I come back. Uh, but when people talk about life as we know it, they're talking about, hey, all this fine-tuning, you're assuming that life has to be just like us. What if it's not just like us? And again, if you're talking to lay audiences, they're thinking, well, maybe you don't have to have intelligent life that's bipedal. Maybe you don't have to have intelligent life that's got two eyes. And often they assume that the fine-tuning evidence I'm giving is assuming the evidence for fine-tuning for life that's exactly like us. And there I have to remind the audience, no, the evidence that I've been presenting to you is simply based on the assumption that life must be carbon-based. So that's what I mean about life as we know it. Not that it's identical to how we human beings look or identical to our dogs and cats and cows and horses look, but simply life uh, is based on carbon. Uh, the molecules that come together to make all living forms. That's the one thing that all life on planet Earth has in common, whether it be viruses, bacteria, uh, whether it be plants, whether it be fungi, detrovores, uh, or human beings, all of it is carbon-based. And so really the scientific argument is, well, wouldn't you have different fine-tuning if life was silicon-based? Wouldn't it be different again if it's boron-based or arsenic-based or sulfur-based? You say, what about all the other elements in the periodic table? Well, scientists have basically realized these are the only four that have any chance of having sufficient biochemical complexity where you could build life on it. So when I come back to you in four weeks, we're going to go through this. Uh, but I remember doing a debate at Caltech at the uh, International Skeptic Society Conference, and uh, Victor Stenger, the particle physicist, was saying, Hugh, your whole argument is based on life as we know it. And he wasn't really referring to silicon base. He says, we could have radically different laws of physics where we don't even have the periodic table. I said, oh, you must be talking about angels. Okay. God has designed more than one kind of intelligent life. But it's basically in my response to Victor Stenger saying, you know, our realm is fine-tuned with certain laws of physics. The angelic realm is also fine-tuned and it would be fine-tuned with different physics. So it says, yeah, I agree with your point. You could have different fine-tuning if we got a radically different life form. Not talking about silicon base, but something where you don't even have elements, you don't even have atoms, you don't even have molecules. But it says, guess what? It's gonna be just as fine-tuned as our universe is uh, for life. That's something the Bible speaks about. Okay, we'll take questions. And as usual, we'll take questions on any topic. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Yeah, I want to remind everybody in the audience, if you want to come up and ask a question, come on up, and I'll take turns between audience, live audience and the virtual audience. We'll start with a question from our friend Doug McComb. He says, just like Doug, he's got a four-part question, so... What moral purpose would you say that eternal torment serves for those who will be in hell? Okay, that's a really good question from our friend Doug. What purpose does eternal torment uh, hold uh, in hell? Well, I'm arguing, and I've made a, a whole chapter on this in uh, the book Beyond the Cosmos, third edition. You'll see a whole chapter there on hell. And basically making the point that uh, when Revelation speaks about the inhabitants of hell being subjected to eternal torment, the Greek word for torment has as its base definition restraint. It's basically making the point all the inhabitants of hell will be restrained and the restraint will not be pleasant. But it also makes a very important caveat that each individual in hell uh, will experience a different level of torment or restraint. And it will be in proportion to the evil they've committed here on earth. And the same thing is going to be true of the fallen angels. The fallen angels will be restrained to the degree that they've committed evil. <coughs> that I'm arguing in Beyond the Cosmos 
It's the same principle that our justice system uses in our prisons. In other words, we have different categories of prisons. And so, you know, if you are convicted of a crime, they determine what kind of prison you're going to go to and then what kind of uh, section within the prison you'll be in. And the principle is based on this, is that criminals who uh, committed minor offenses do not need to be restrained to the same degree as uh, you know, uh, criminals who've committed really major offenses. Um, and in particular, criminals that are in danger of harming their fellow uh, inmates in prison, they're the ones that are going to be restrained to the greatest degree. And so they'll be put into solitary confinement, for example, if they know, hey, if we let them out, they're going to do serious harm to, to their fellow prisoners. And so the principle is this, that the level of restraint that God imposes on the uh, humans and angels that are in the lake of fire is going to be sufficient to prevent them from making hell a worse place than otherwise would be. In that sense, I'm arguing uh, that the restraint is an expression of God's love, that God so loves the inhabitants of hell that he ensures that each one of them gets just enough restraint to prevent them from making hell a worse environment than otherwise would be. Because that's kind of the main argument I hear against hell. And by the way, a lot of evangelical theologians think that hell cannot possibly be eternal. The torment cannot be eternal because they see that as a contradiction with God's love. But the way I put this is that God gives every human being a choice of where they want to spend eternity. You can choose to spend eternity with God or you can choose to spend eternity without God. And there are people who want nothing to do with God. And God says, well, you want nothing to do with me, I got a place for you. But if you want to spend eternity with me, I got a place for you. And it's a mistake to think uh, that when someone is sent to hell, they're going to repent, they're going to re have regrets and say, you know, I blew it, I really want to go to heaven. No, the people in hell are those that are completely committed to have nothing to do with God. They actually would look at heaven as a worse torment than hell because now they'd be forced to spend time with people that are followers of Jesus Christ and with God, and they want nothing to do with that. And so they actually prefer that. Now, one of the pastors on our staff years ago is an individual who spent a lot of time with people who are at death's door. And he told me multiple stories of unbelievers who were lucid at the time of death and were literally rejoicing and gleeful that they were going to go to hell. They wanted to go to hell because it's a place where they have had nothing to do with Christians. No, no Christians would ever bother them ever again because none of them would be there. They'd have nothing to do with God or the righteous angels. And they looked at that as a far preferable outcome and rejoicing the fact that that's where they got to go. Okay, that was part one. Uh, I'll let, uh, yeah, we'll come up with part two later. Thanks. Hi, Hugh. Uh, we started off by saying that uh, if any of, the, any of the physical constants of the universe were changed, life uh, could not exist. Now, you can make that statement, uh, but I wonder if you could put a little bit, little, little bit of meat on that statement so that I understand why some small change eliminates the possibility of life. the one who's done the most on this is the British physicist John Barrow. He's written like half a dozen books basically on the laws and constants of physics and how it's possible you could change one constant as long as you change another constant to perfectly counterbalance that you can probably make things work but if you take any one of the constants and change it independent of the others things uh, don't work and he gives several examples of what happens when you make tiny changes uh, in the constants of physics. The one I found easiest for lay people to understand is the velocity of light. Why? Because almost every lay person knows one equation. They don't know F equals MA, but they know E equals MC squared. So that seems to be in the minds of everybody. 
uh, Einstein's equation is special relativity. E equals mc squared. E is energy. M is mass. C is the velocity of light. And so, for example, if you were to change the velocity of light ever so slightly, it would mean that the energy output from stars would be radically changed. So, for example, if you were to uh, uh, double uh, the velocity of light, it would mean that the energy output from the sun would be four times greater than it is right now. And we all know that even a 1% change in the sun's luminosity, it'd be game over uh, for advanced life here on planet Earth. Although it's interesting, yesterday on my Facebook page, somebody disputed that and said, well, wait a minute, it's not that sensitive uh, because in the wintertime, uh, we have the sun's luminosity compared to the summertime being 1.7% different. Therefore, your argument falls apart. And I had to explain, look, I meant long-term averaged. I mean, we're not talking a change in the velocity of light over a few months. I'm talking a change in the velocity of light over thousands or millions of years. If that were to change by 1%, it would cause our planet to become completely frozen or it would cause all the water to evaporate into outer space. And so, yes, uh, a, ch a tiny change in the velocity of light makes a big difference in the energy output uh, coming uh, from stars. Uh, and we know the velocity of light has been held uh, constant. Incidentally, young Earth creationists, that's one of their go-to arguments. The universe can't be billions of years old because maybe the light from distant stars, uh, the velocity of light might have been a million times faster uh, at the time of uh, Adam and therefore the light gets to us a million times faster than what astronomers think. But hey, if the light gets to us a million times faster, that means the heat from the sun would be a trillion times greater. And the Genesis text is quite clear that the sun was not a trillion times hotter at the time of Adam than it is uh, today. So that's probably the easiest one to understand. The most spectacular ones, however, uh, would be the strong and weak nuclear forces change them ever so slightly, and you wind up with a universe with no molecules. And if you've got a universe with no molecules, you've got a universe with no light. So I do give a few more examples in the Crater and the Cosmos 4th edition. If you want the full story, John Barrow's got a 600-page book where he goes into it in detail. Thanks. Part 2. Thanks, you. <laughs> Val Durham wants to know, Alexander Vilenkin's relativity theorem indicates multiverses also must have beginnings. How does this negate the argument against the Big Bang beginnings? Okay, that's a good point that Alexander Vilenkin has made. He's not alone. Every astronomer I know that's promoting the multiverse as an argument against God is saying it's an argument against a personal God. It's not really an argument against deism because all multiverse models designed to eliminate the idea of fine-tuning for our benefit, saying it's just by pure chance, they're all subject to the space-time theorems. Basically saying we don't eliminate the need for God as the one who creates this universe of matter, energy, space, and time. The multiverse is really focusing on trying to deny that God is a personal being, a being that cares about his creation a being that's provided for his creatures. So that's where the atheist version of the multiverse is targeting. And it's something I've noticed in the latest books being published by astronomers and physicists who are atheists. When you actually read their books, uh, they are deists, they're not atheists. I mean, even, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of his name, Lawrence Krauss, probably the most famous atheist physicist in America. He's written in his books, we cannot take deism off the scientific table. A force of the space-time theorems basically means we can't get around that, but he says we certainly can take care of this weird idea that God is a personal being. And so that's where the multiverse is really targeting. I'll ask a question since there's not another, I'm part of the audience, so I get to ask one. Um, one, of, one of the things that I've heard said against fine-tuning that's not on your list is this idea that we're living in a simulation. We're living in the matrix. Can you comment on that? 
Yeah, I didn't put that on my list. I know it's common, uh, but uh, you know, it's kind of like dealing with a Christian scientist when they say that the physical world isn't real, uh, only the spiritual world is real. And I remember Walter Martin saying, whenever you get into an argument with a Christian scientist, just punch them on the nose. And when they scream with pain, just say, that's not real. <laughs> only the spiritual realm is real. Why are you crying? <laughs> so and I mean, actually, to be honest, uh, what he did say is, I don't really want you to punch him in the nose. <laughs> but use that argument as a way to show, hey, uh, it's simply absurd to claim that the physical world is not real. However, it's actually addressed in the book of Colossians and the book of Galatians. Because at the time of the apostles, there was these teachers going around within the Christian church saying, only the spirit realm is real. Only the spirit Jesus is real. The physical Jesus that we thought was physical is really not real. That's a delusion. And this physical world we live in is a delusion. And now we have that movie, The Matrix, I think is going into its fourth uh, sequel, uh, where they're basically making the point that uh, we think we have physical bodies, we think we live in a physical universe, but the truth is, it's just simply a masterful computer simulation. And how do you rebut that? It's like, well, we are able to make these repeated measurements that tell us that we really do live in a physical realm. We wouldn't be able to make measurements. We wouldn't be able to have the natural realm react against those measurements. Because whenever physicists or chemists uh, make measurements, they're disturbing the system. If this is just an illusion, a computer simulation, why do we see uh, these disturbances? So I didn't put it on my list because I don't know of any physicist uh, or mathematician or physical chemist uh, that would say uh, that, hey, Everything we see around here is a complete illusion. We think our lives are real. They're really not real. It's all an illusion. And, uh, but this has not just been since the movie The Matrix came out. It goes back thousands of years, this idea. Okay, and what drives this idea that we live in a computer simulation or the physical realm is an illusion? If the physical realm is an illusion, our sins are an illusion. And so we really don't need a redeemer. And that's what Colossians and Galatians is really pointing out. The real heresy of this idea of Gnosticism or Christian science or the matrix is that people are using it as an excuse to say, I'm really not responsible for the sins I committed since those sins are all illusory. And that's why Paul is saying it's every bit as real as the universe in which we live. Okay, we have another internet question from Chris Thompson. He asks, do you believe that CO2 reduction techniques will have any appreciable effect on global warming? Okay, the main attempt to try to reduce global warming is to say, well, we can keep burning these fossil fuels, but we can capture the carbon dioxide that's being released. And so there are groups of scientists and engineers trying to find a way that we can capture the carbon dioxide uh, that's being released uh, from fossil fuel burning and turn that into marketable products. It's not yet at the point of break even, uh, but there's been remarkable progress. And so uh, they actually have built incinerators uh, where they got scrubbers on the inside of the chimneys of these incinerators that capture the carbon dioxide and then convert that carbon dioxide uh, into alcohol and other kinds of fuels that could be burned. The whole idea is, well, if we can make this economic where the carbon dioxide we capture can be sold as a fuel, we won't have to pull any more fossil fuels out of the ground and we can just keep recycling this. And so that's the goal. We're not there yet, but they have made remarkable achievement. And so uh, there are governments that are actually saying, well, it's not economic yet, but maybe we can force it uh, by putting uh, big taxes on it. And it's like, I'm personally in favor of, uh, let's give the scientists more time to make it economically uh, uh, feasible, because yeah, if we ever get to the point. And incidentally, 
uh, I wrote one article at reasons.org where the one place where they found they could make it economic is basically using the technology to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, not from fossil fuel burning, they just literally take it out of the atmosphere, and then using solar energy to convert that carbon dioxide into synthetic fuels that can be used as jet fuel. And they actually determine that if they were to carpet the Sahara Desert with 10,000 square kilometers of solar panels, they could supply all the jet fuel for all the aircraft all the jet aircraft in the world. In fact, they could even take care of the prop planes. So it's actually out there. All we need to do is put in 10,000 square kilometers of solar panels on a part of the Sahara Desert where nothing's growing anyway, and uh, use that uh, to basically supply all the fuel that all the aircraft in the world need. Now that would only make a dent, but it would make a significant dent uh, in alleviating uh, the uh, expulsion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And there you don't need any scrubbing technology. You're basically pulling the carbon dioxide that's act naturally existing there in the atmosphere. Let me see if I can formulate this. Um, after the rapture, in the rapture, the whole church is going up with Jesus, right? To be with Jesus. And then comes the millennial. And during the millennial, the devil is going to be tied up, and God is going to prove that man is bad in, in himself because it's going to be sin even though the devil is tied up, right? So there's no action from the devil directly. Okay. I know you're talking about the rapture. What exactly the point do you want me to address? Oh, okay, so... Okay, uh, the, the millennial is, is, is my concern because if the church goes up with the Lord, okay, but there is still going to be sin, and we are going to be ruling, if I'm part of this church, I'm going to be ruling over, that's my first question is over who is, uh, I'm going to be ruling, we are going to be ruling. And the other one is if r ruling, over who are we? Whom are we going to be ruling? Oh God, yeah. Because we are going, the church is going to rule, right, during the uh, thousand years. So, who are the people who are going to be ruling over? And the other question is, if there is a chance for the church to sin during this time, because there is going to be sin, even though the devil is going to be tied up during all these 1,000 years. So is it possible that if I go in the rapture and then I come with Jesus to rule, am I going to be also able to sin and be judged because the judgment comes after that? So, yes, okay. Yeah, a lot of questions there. I'm gonna focus on kind of your last point, which I think is what you really want answered. And incidentally, if you want a complete answer to this, we have a seven-year recording of a class we did here on the Book of Revelation. It's available at paradoxes.org, so you can download it as a set of MP3s. Uh, they, they take out all the announcements, so you won't have to listen to Ross Hoagland. All you do is get the... <laughs> Actually, Ross was not the moderator then. It was a fellow by the name of Tom. Uh, uh, so we edited out his comments. You just get the class, and they took out a lot of the repetition as well. Uh, but here's how I would respond to that. Yes, I do believe that uh, there will be a thousand-year reign here on planet Earth. So uh, I am premillennial in my theology, but not all the scholars have reasons to believe are premillennial. So, for example, Ken Samples is amillennial. He doesn't believe that there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ here, literally, on planet Earth. I do. And uh, what's going to happen during that time? Well... It tells us that before that thousand-year reign, uh, that the people who are committed to unbelief, they will be assigned uh, uh, to, to hell. So uh, we begin the millennium uh, with only believers. But there's going to be two kinds of believers. There will be the believers that come back with Jesus Christ, and there's a debate about whether they all come back 
or just a small contingent come back. But these would be Christians uh, who have been glorified, which means they've reached a point where they do not sin. But there will be people that have survived the great tribulation as believers that also come into the millennium. And so they've not yet been glorified. And they will be the ones that will be continuing to have children. And so they'll be having children throughout the millennium. And it tells us at the end of the millennium that God releases Satan from his prison. And that Satan goes throughout the world uh, to tempt all these uh, people. Now, the ones that have come back with Christ from heaven, uh, they'll be immune to that uh, temptation. However, the children born during the millennium, many of them will listen to the temptation of Satan. And they are the ones uh, that, because uh, it, it says at the end of the thousand years uh, that the majority of the children born during the millennium choose to rebel against Jesus, which is kind of a shocking statement because for a thousand years, we've got Jesus Christ in physical form ruling from downtown Jerusalem with a technology that 100% of the world's population can see him. I mean, we have television technology. We've got computers. Uh, there's going to be the internet. I think all that's going to be existing during the millennium. But I believe that one reason why God established the millennium, and this is just speculation on my part, but I think it's similar to what we see with the story of the flood, that God gave humanity a time when we could potentially live a lot longer than 100 years. And we realize it was not good to live a long time. Look what happened. Likewise, he's going to say, I'm going to set up a thousand years where there's going to be a perfect government. God himself is going to be the prime minister of the world. And he's going to have ruling with him magistrates that are these perfected Christians who are sin free. So you're not going to have sinful politicians anymore. I mean, can you imagine a world without sinful politicians? An incredible concept to think about. Uh, but that's what we see promised in the millennium. But basically what I believe God is doing during those thousand years, he's removing every excuse for why we sin except the real reason. And what we see is the consequence is the same as it is for us today. The majority of humans say, I want nothing to do with God. A large minority say, I want to be with God. During the millennium, when we got Jesus personally ruling with a perfect government, a great economy, I mean, as he even says he's going to take away carnivorous activity. You can't say the devil made me do it because he's locked up for the thousand years. There's really nobody to blame except what you see recorded in Jeremiah chapter 17. That the reason we're sinners is because of the evil and rebellion in our heart. And except for the grace of God, we would all be condemned. But it's God's grace that can break through the stubbornness of the human heart. But we need to come to God to get the grace and the humility that we need. But evidently, the whole human species needs an object lesson. So my theology of the millennium, it's a huge object lesson to drive home the real reason why we are sinners. And I think it's an, an, uh, an object lesson not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of the angels. Because the angels are also mystified about this grace that God bestows upon us miserable, sinful human beings. And so I think this is going to help the angels understand as well. Now, a lot of Christian theologians really disagree uh, with my speculation on the millennium. I'm just telling you where I personally stand. Uh, I've got books that basically lay out many different views on the millennium. And so there's a lot of debate amongst Christian theologians about what the scripture is teaching about the millennium. Okay. Hi. Okay. Yeah, you need um, to get close to okay. the microphone. My, my question has to do with time. I seem to be confused about it because in heaven there's no time, right? Well, in heaven there's no cosmic time. I do believe in heaven there's temporality. And so we human beings... I think have a misconception about time because time for us is one dimensional. 
And one of the things I notice in reading the book of Revelation is that there's going to be no marriage in heaven. There's going to be no families in heaven. Evidently, it won't be necessary. Families and marriage is crucial to experience the intimacy God wants us to experience under the condition that we're constrained to a single dimension of time. And so cosmic time will be eradicated uh, when God conquers evil because God's going to replace his universe with a brand new realm. But the new realm is not going to be a realm without temporal experiences. We're going to be able to experience love, express love. Uh, we're going to be able to communicate. And so we're going to have temporal experiences. And notice that the triune God had temporal experiences before God created cosmic time. So one of the books I have in my office is uh, from a conference I participated in at Cambridge University back in 2005. It was a conference on God, eternity, and time. And they invited a team of philosophers and a team of scientists. And what was fun is uh, I had two sessions. Everybody had two sessions. I had to debate a philosopher on God, eternity, and time. And I had to debate a scientist on God, eternity, and time. All of us were believers, but we all had different models on God, eternity, and time. And they wound up writing a book about all the different models and the debates that were going on. All the debates were very friendly. Uh, but the audience, I think, uh, was really just thrilled hearing all of us debate one another and come with different ideas. And one of the things we all learned is because we're constrained to linear time, we can't come up with a complete definition of time, which explains why people have so many different models on God, eternity, and time. I just kind of gave you my model because I think that the new creation, we're not going to be constrained to linear time. We're going to be able to experience geometric time. Yeah, when, when I'm thinking, when I'm praying and I'm thinking about it, I think, I know I'm thinking it wrong somewhere, is that when I die, I will be in a place that doesn't have time in heaven, right? You have cosmic time in heaven, but when you die and go to be with the Lord, and all the saints that have died before you in the Lord, you're going to be having temporal experiences. You'll be able to have conversations. You'll be able to observe what's going on in the face of the earth. You're going to be enjoying fellowship with the rest of the dead in Christ, with the angels, with God. You're going to be having all those experiences. That will not go away, but it's not going to be experiences within the single time dimension of our universe. It's going to be a different kind of temporality. Now, where there's been debate is that temporal experiences we experience before we get our resurrected bodies and after we get our resurrected bodies, is it going to be dimensions of time or maybe we're released into two dimensions of time, uh, like the dimension of time we experience here in our universe or three dimensions of time? Or is it going to be something that's not at all like the dimensions of time but nevertheless permits temporal experiences? Answer is, I don't know. Uh, God's got lots of options. But hey, you've got a lot to look forward to when you pass from this life. It's not going to be boring. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think that, uh, hey, when we die as a follower of Jesus Christ, we go into a state of sleep, which what they mean by that is a state where we're completely unconscious. That is not accurate theology. The Bible is clear. Yes, we're in a state of sleep in the sense that there will be things that we can't do then that we can do now. I've used the analogy, it's like we who are alive on planet Earth today, we're like the football players on the football field. When we pass from this life and die and go to be with the Lord and the dead in Christ, we basically go up into the stands and we become spectators. Now notice the spectators at a football game are fully conscious, but they can't influence the events on the playing field. They can only cheer, they can only boo. And basically that's what it tells us in scripture, that when a sinner repents here on earth, the angels rejoice, they cheer. The dead in Christ will cheer, uh, but they can't really have a role in uh, determining who's gonna repent and what they're going to do. So that means while you're alive here on earth, even though you're only gonna be alive for 100 or 110 years, live your life for all you're worth, because when you die, you go up to be a spectator. 
until you get your body. When you get your eternal body, once again, you're going to be a player. You won't just be a spectator. But while we wait for the redemption of the full number of human beings that have yet to be redeemed, and you're, you're finished with your life here on earth, in that sense, you're a spectator. So Abraham has been a spectator for a long, long time. The wonderful thing about being alive in the 21st century, we don't have to spend that much time as a spectator. On the other hand, if you've ever been to a football game, it can be a lot of fun being a spectator. And so uh, look forward to it. The dead in Christ, they, they, they have a, a good thing going. We've got one more question, Hugh, uh, before we run out of time. It's on the internet. It's from some guy named Jamie Campbell. I think uh, he's one of those internet <laughs> trolls. We've got to watch out for him. <laughs> he says, will the devil, beast, and false prophet be tormented in the lake of fire day and night forever and ever, as per Revelations 2010? And I'll add, is the lake of fire literal fire? Okay. As you're probably aware, there's a major debate amongst Christians. Uh, is hell a place of eternal torment or just temporal torment? And is the doctrine of annihilationism really true? And so people look at hell as something that's not consistent with God's love, would say, well, what makes sense is uh, that the people who say, I want nothing to do with God, God just snuffs them out of existence. He, he annihilates them. He does not put them into eternal torment in the lake of fire. I have a problem with that because as I read scripture, it seems to be teaching that all spirit beings, once God creates them, continue to exist for the rest of eternity. And so since we human beings are spiritual beings, the idea that we're being annihilated uh, when we choose to rebel against Jesus Christ in a permanent way seems to have an issue uh, with that implication. And also, I would argue, as I've already said, I don't really agree with the idea that eternal torment in hell uh, contradicts the love of God. It's what we do with prisoners uh, in the criminal system. We basically give them sufficient torment in order to make things as best as possible for them and for everybody else. The wonderful thing about Revelation 20 is it says they'll only be tormented to the degree that they've committed evil here on planet Earth. So I expect someone like Adolf Hitler is going to experience a whole lot more torment uh, than Albert Schweitzer. Both of them are rebels against Jesus Christ, uh, but one lived an exemplary humanitarian life and the other one sent millions of people to their death in a very torturous way. And so one has a much greater potential to make hell a much more miserable place than the other. So in that sense, I see a consistency. Do I think that the lake of fire is literal fire? Well, what I notice in uh, the gospel accounts, Jesus spoke a lot about heaven and hell, but he spoke about heaven and hell that I think are metaphors and not literal. So he basically was telling us what heaven was like and it's basically making the point, hey, my description, it's better than that. And basically he's using analogies for hell, saying, yeah, the torment of hell, what's it like? It's worse than the pain of being burned alive. And you know, if you ever had a burn, it's very painful. Basically saying, yeah. And who knows if it's gonna be physical pain, but it's gonna be something that'll be extremely tormenting. Or the another analogy that Jesus used, hell is a place like where you've got all these worms crawling over your body and they're biting you. It's like, I can't think of anything more uncomfortable than that analogy. And, uh, but I don't think that hell is a place where we're in a pit with worms crawling all over us and biting us. Uh, or it's a place where we're being incinerated uh, by a fire. Basically, Jesus is making the point, the torment in hell is real. The torment in hell is necessary to prevent hell from becoming worse than otherwise is. And you need to realize it's way worse than anything you can imagine. By the same token, the rewards that we experience in heaven are way better than the analogies that Jesus gave us about heaven. It's better than what any of us can think or possibly imagine. And so just realize, no, I don't think it's a little fire. For one thing, it's gonna be a realm without the laws of physics. The laws of physics are gonna be replaced by different physical laws. And so the fire we experience here 
is not going to be the same as any kind of fire that will exist in the new creation. Thank you, Hugh. Would you please close us in prayer? Be happy to do that. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you've seen fit to give us so much evidence, especially in the 21st century, for how you've designed this universe so that we can thrive here on planet Earth. But not only designed us so we can thrive, you designed us so that we can be redeemed from our sin and evil. So, Father, I pray that you make it possible for me in these next weeks and months, Lord, to really uh, make that point clear, uh, that it's not just designed to make bacteria possible or to make us human beings possible, but it's designed to make our redemption possible. The whole universe has been created with redemption in mind. So, Father, may we gain insights from that, and may we be able to use these insights in such a way uh, to attract other people to the Christian faith. And Father, thousands, millions have been led to Christ through the fine-tuning argument. Father, we pray that many more millions will, and that each of us in this class, whether we're here personally or virtually, would have the joy and the thrill of bringing someone to faith in Jesus Christ uh, through these evidences. In Jesus' name, amen. And let me just share with all of you in closing, this fine-tuning series is a great opportunity to bring your non-Christian friends associates and relatives. So if you know anybody, and you always tell them, most of the class is devoted to questions and debate. And so they'll have lots of opportunity uh, to challenge and debate these issues. Okay, thank you. Pardon me? Well, uh, I got a couple, I don't know all the trips I'm doing. I know I'm going to DC. I'm also knowing I'm going to Chattanooga to do some television shows. And uh, yeah, when I go to the office tomorrow, they'll tell me else, what else I'm doing. <laughs> However, if there's a week where I'm not traveling, I'm going to make it a point to try to come because I'd like to hear what Robert cavallo has got to say. Uh, you know, this, this gentleman, uh, Kuiper, uh, Abraham Kuiper, is an amazing individual. And you're going to hear from somebody who's really studied him in depth.